But today, we have an extraordinarily um, uh, powerful set of tools which are available to anyone. Hello, everybody, um, uh, and welcome uh, to this session of the Dyslexia Commission Inquiry. Um, it, and um, with many thanks uh, to you, Ben, Paula, uh, to the British Dyslexia Association for pulling all of this work together. Um, the first session we're going to do today is going into the uh, coordination of care. And we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Mike Bowick, who was the former Deputy Medical Director of, uh, of the NHS, of NHS England. Um, and we're going to hear from him about on the ground, the practical realities of this critical question of the, of the coordination, especially between different agencies needed to support those who have uh, uh, particular needs. Um, and of course, um, mostly the work on dyslexia and certainly the work that I've been focused on um, has been focused on the uh, education aspect of uh, the need to support uh, children with dyslexia. Uh, but I know very well from my three years as health secretary, the critical importance of making sure we have a broad support right across uh, the range and the spectrum of conditions. So, Mike, you're very welcome. It's great that you're uh, that you're with us and you're going to uh, chair the, the next sections as well, not least because it turns out in Parliament it's quite a busy week. Um, and so uh, there's an awful lot going on at this end in the sort of the politics of choosing the next uh, prime minister. So I apologize that that is going to drag me um, away after a bit. Um, we're going to have a, a panel on this subject on the coordination of care um, with uh, Claire Thomas, who's the head of therapy at Level Schools. Uh, and Claire, you're uh, very welcome. I'll throw over to you in just a minute. But beforehand, I want to, uh, I want to just say this. You know, um, ensuring that we get the support to those who have complex care needs, who are dyslexic, is incredibly important to me. Um, after the last general election in 2019, I put together a, a, a small team of civil servants to work on this question because so many of the challenges are essentially cross-cutting uh, across different departments. And I felt it had never been gripped. You know, the Department for Education has an important uh, part to play in this. Uh, the Health Department obviously has an important part to play. Uh, and it, sadly, the, the criminal justice system uh, needs to be uh, better supportive of people who have uh, a neurodiverse condition. Um, and frankly, there's a cross government job. So I put together a small team to really try to grip it. That was in December 2019. Uh, that that team had barely got going when the pandemic struck and they had to be moved on to more pressing um, issues. So for me, this is unfinished business. I'm really glad that the Dyslexia Commission is going into it uh, and, and, and pushing on this area. Um, I, I think that there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done uh, by government, by the agencies in this space, whether it's NHS England and on the education side. Uh, but the most important thing is setting uh, the agenda for what needs to happen um because my experience of being in government is that when something falls between two of the big silos and you know health and education are two of the biggest silos of them all uh, then that's often where things um get dropped and and don't get delivered so that's my um that's my view of it i want to be you know from my point of view i want to be totally evidence-led um, I, uh, I, I think it's an, uh, an area where, you know, there, there isn't any, you know, from a political, from a, certainly when I was there, from a ministerial point of view, you know, this isn't about, it's very much cross-party. It isn't about um, party politics, but it is about shining the spotlight on the attention that's needed uh, in this space. And I hope that everybody will, uh, will agree. The audience today comes from... Uh, the NHS, civil society, uh, academics, and uh, dyslexia practice experts. Um, and we're very keen to hear your perspectives on this. 
um, your, the reason that you're interested, uh, what insights you can bring to what changes need to happen. And all of this happens uh, ahead this afternoon of a debate in Parliament on uh, the dyslexia screening bill that will have its second reading on the 16th of September. That continues despite all of the sort of political noise and headwinds. Um, and um, that debate, uh, you know, will be informed by the discussion that we have uh, today. Um, the, the bill is, very, is obviously focused in the education space. And I'm not really sure that what we're going to talk about today is a matter for primary legislation. It's probably, you know, the, what's needed is probably too um, uh, subtle and sophisticated for primary legislation. Um, but they, the debate on um, how we support those with dyslexia will, that's, that's now pretty live in Parliament uh, will be informed by the discussion we have. Um, today. So that's my, um, that's my intro. Um, can I now hand over to Claire Thomas, if you can introduce yourself, uh, you're going to give an opening statement, and then we'll go on to a discussion and a Q&A. Claire, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just want to say, in addition to my own dyslexia, I've got COVID yesterday. Um, so sorry if I cough. Um, throughout this but we'll give it a go. So I'm the head of therapy at the Level School um, where we we set up the school in 2020 at the very start of the lockdown um, where the previous school that I worked at which was a special needs school suddenly closed due to insolvency. So we spent about nine months I would say extreme volunteering um, to set up the school and open in January 2021. Um, I've also been a peer reviewer on the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists um, a position paper on social emotional mental health in children and young people and I've got experience in uh, attending tribunals and the EHCP process. Um, we often call the level school dyslexia plus and I think that's one of the big things at the moment is that to get any EHCP you have to have a dyslexia and a co-occurring co need because dyslexia is generally well catered for in mainstream education these days um, but what we find now is you have to have additional diagnoses to get um, an EHCP. So we, our school is made up of children with dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, ADHD, um, and then we've got children with adverse childhood experiences, so ACEs. And most of our school have anxiety. Um, and I think there's a huge crossover. If you think about co-occurring needs, <laughs> Um, actually, there's a huge link between dyslexia and mental health, which needs to be looked at. Um, we also have 50% um, of dyslexics we know have developmental language disorder. And I think this is really unknown within the teaching profession. If you're thinking about having dyslexics with co-occurring needs, 50% having an additional language disorder is huge. Um, the Guardian recently said it's the most common unknown disability. And I think it's unknown because actually speech therapists are the ones who diagnose it. And there's just not many speech therapists out there. Um, since starting the level school, we've seen that the EHCP process has taken even longer than normal. So it should be 20 weeks. And actually what we're seeing now is can take up to a year and a half um, to get your EHCP. And we're having tribunals booked now, um, which will happen in November. So there's a huge delay in the tribunal process as well. Um, thinking about children and mental health needs, I think I think it was Lord Addington who said last time that we need to go together as lots of different neurodiversities. And when our students get CAMS appointments, what we're finding is actually that the CAMS is not appropriate. The provision they're being given is not appropriate because it's cognitive behavioral therapy which relies on language disorders, um, which relies on language difficulties. And actually, if you have a language difficulty, you can't access a language-based counselling. Um, we're really lucky that we've got an art therapist starting in September at our school, so we can do the mental health work without focusing on language. Um, so thinking about like the positives and what we need to do to change, I know it's all those nuances that need to change, but counsellors generally across the board need to have training in neurodiversity. Um, it's not only so that they can refer on if they've noticed that there's a neurodiverse condition that hasn't been diagnosed, but also so they can modify their counselling if they need to, to make it accessible for children with neurodiversity. Um, what, we've, what I'm very aware of is being dyslexic myself, that what is out there at the moment is so much more positive than when I was at school. It was so negative to be dyslexic at school. There's so many more positives about being dyslexic 
But in terms of the system, it's actually harder because what we've noticed is that educational psychologists as part of the local authority EHCP assessments are not doing standardized tests anymore. And what that has a massive knock on effect is that children are not being diagnosed with dyslexia anymore because what educational psychologists are doing are just doing phone calls to parents to find out the, what's going on. But without a standardized assessment, you're not gonna get a full picture of that child's needs which then means that actually you're going to have really weak education, health and care plans, which is what we've seen coming through. Um, I recently did an annual review where there was an outcome which just said fine and gross motor skills. Now that's not smart. Um, and so we're seeing really watered down EHCP since the pandemic. Um, and actually that's not good for children with mental health difficulties and dyslexia. Yeah. Um, so just to end on a bit of a positive note of what we're doing at the level school as a preventative measure um, to help our children with the mental health difficulties is we're running a project called Owning Your Neurodiversity, which gives our year 11 students an opportunity to understand um, the strengths and difficulties with dyslexia, um, but also and other neurodiversities, but also what reasonable adjustments they can ask for out in the workplace, what laws are there to support them and how they can talk to their friends about it so they can see that actually it's a positive and that they can advocate for themselves. And that's been really beneficial. I'm not sure how you could translate that maybe into mainstream education because it's myself and the Senko who have a weekly session with these kids, but it's been really valuable. Um, so yeah, back to you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Thank you very much for uh, for setting that out. Um, and that really comes from the educational um, side. Uh, uh, Mike, I wonder whether I can bring you in first and then go to questions from the floor um, in terms of coming at this from the, uh, from the health side, because it really is about pulling the, uh, the, the two systems together and all put, your, put that you want to ask a question uh, in, the, in the chat. And we have a series of pre-submitted questions that I'm going to ask uh, Claire, Mike, and others to, uh, to, to answer as well. Uh, Mike. Uh, thank you, Matt. And just to say, I think that this is something that is rarely on the agenda of doctors and medics in particular, other than those in specialised fields of, of this area. And I think that one of the great problems is that this diagnosis, there isn't a a, a key role for GPs that are, is seen within this. And I think that has to change. So the ICSs that are now in statute and are coming on board and will be influencing uh, the commissioning of care need to think seriously about how they're going to join up this way of working, not just with their social care elements of it, but actually with the educational partners that they'll meet in places like the health and wellbeing boards that are around the country. And I think this is an opportunity to push for this type of a problem to be on the, on the front foot at the moment, which it has never been. I mean, if I was going back to my old role as a GP in practice, I would say, what has this got to do with me? My wife would be uh, in my ear saying, I'm a teacher, I've tried to work with GPs for years in Suicide and various other areas uh, to try and get on the agenda, early diagnosis, early prescription and, and early impact. And I think the ICSs have to actually look at this as to what the societal advantages will be and adding value, uh, if, not, if nothing else, to the effectiveness and efficiency of our society uh, and the inclusion of people who, to be quite frank, have felt excluded for many, many years. I'll come back to this a bit more Matt, when we're doing this uh, second or third section. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike, uh, for setting up, you know, in, in a sense, the motivation, the need for this, uh, uh, for this uh, work. Um, Fiona Knight. Would you just set out what you put in the chat in a bit more detail? I think it's really uh, it's, it's very interesting as, as a challenge. It is a challenge. So my son, um, we had the watered down EHCP process over the pandemic. Um, he's in year six primary. We had the EHCP, um, agreed it being totally um, unaware of how much ill-educated we were in the system we've um we've been appealing it for some time my son had we had finally had an agreement for flexi school for the whole of year six which we paid privately so he could have specific dyslexic provision one day a week 
He's been out of the classroom in year six for 65% of the time, therefore affecting his mental health because he's been teased and bullied by his peers for being thick and stupid. Um, um, we went through the painstaking um, uh, journey of trying to get a specialist placement, which we have now at the moat through cost to ourselves. But now, because of tribunal backlog, which we've been told because there's not the specialist on send panel, the tribunal hearings and until the 6th of January, our local authority are saying that the local high school can meet needs. They haven't seen all, all the updated document as well as the 14 page grounds of appeal that we've put forward. Um, so basically, my son is being said that he has to join the school up the road. He's two to three years behind. He didn't sit SATs because his primary school said he wasn't at that point and it would impact on his mental health all the more. And um, yeah, that's where we are. It's just horrendous. It is horrendous. And I'm exhausted. I bet. Um, thank you, Fiona. Um, the... Um... Uh, if, you, if you want to get involved and say uh, make a contribution, please raise your hand. I'm next going to go to uh, Charles Freeman. Before I do, I'm going to add some of the pre-submitted questions, which build on what Fiona's just um, said and described, actually, which is um, it, it, it comes down to the coordination of care and access to care more than anything, doesn't it? And how we can make sure that that coordination improves seems to be the central question. Uh, you know, um, I've come across this most in terms of the need for identification, but then the question of making sure that once identified, the care flows after that um, seems to come up time and, uh, and time again. Uh, Charles Freeman. Can um, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I just posting a number of links from Amanda Kirby, because one of the things which uh, and I think Claire makes a really good point um, about co-occurrence. Um, I think for most of us, um, co-occurrence is the norm. And if you add in anxiety um, and mental health challenges, um, it's all, probably almost universal for neuro neurodivergent people and dyslexic people. Um, but I think the worst outcomes tend to be concentrated in the people who don't get picked up. Um, and I, I, um, one of the reports I was about to post was a report to the probation inspectorate that Amanda did, that identified a quarter of unemployed people um, are neurodivergent, one, uh, one third of young people um, who um, are encountering the justice system are neurodivergent, mostly undiagnosed. Um, and um, I think on top of that, the Roundtree Trust did some research, said diagnosis tends to be concentrated in the most prosperous areas, um, whereas, um, and Amanda puts this in a beautiful article contrasting Marlowe and Middlesbrough, you get a completely different diagnosis um, depending on your background. Um, how do we overcome that? How do we actually get over the diversity inclusion paradox of dyslexia and neurodiversity, where if you have the right support networks, you get support. If you don't have the right support networks, you flounder. So one of the things I've really been struck by in the work I've done on this is the, uh, the social injustice of who gets the support. Um, and um, those, uh, you know, those with very complex conditions often get a lot of support. It may not be as much as they need because their needs are that much higher. Um, and then there is often a heavy um, amount of support that goes to those who essentially you know, have the greatest parental capability to get through the system and get the support and if necessary, pay for the diagnoses. And I just think this is one of the many injustices in this space. There's a sort of a, a, a U-shape curve of the access to, um, uh, to support, respect, particularly a, a correlation with parental capability. 
um, and highly unlikely to be a positive one at the top end. But that is what we see, um, the, which is all which all indicates a problem with um, with access to identification. And I, personally, I think the only solution to this is universalism, um, as in you have to make sure everybody has that uh, that access. Um, Claire, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I agree that actually to, we find that the parents who get the robust EHCPs are the ones who can pay for private SALT, OT and educational psychology reports and are the ones who can fund solicitors. Now, that costs about £12,000 to get from the start of the EHCP process if you go into tribunal, which most parents can't afford to pay. Um, what we've also noticed since the pandemic is that local authorities are no longer always given educational psychologists, the ones who are doing the main assessing for the EHCPs. So that's the key document for an education, health and care plan is an educational psychologist. So no longer doing standardised assessments. But what they're also doing is they're sending educational psychology assistants out to gather the information, which then makes such a weaker education, health and care plan because it's not even someone with the right training who's written it. So I think there's this huge postcode lottery and it's the parents who can fund getting the reports. They're the ones who win the tribunals because I've sat in tribunals where the local authority has said that the educational psychologist didn't meet the child. So their report is useless, but the parents funded an educational psychologist who did meet the child and they've won specialist provision based on that. So I agree, there's this huge postcode lottery and we need to work with the local authorities to make them stick to timeframes, but make them have um, appropriate reports done. Uh, yes, I mean, that, that actually um, uh, calls for more of a national approach, right? Um, and um, which we have in the CARE Act 2014, but doesn't seem to uh, apply in this space. I don't know if anybody has any explanations for why not and what changes might be helpful there, because you know, the idea of the CARE Act 2014 was to uh, ensure that the, um, the hurdles for provision are nationally prescribed, even though the delivery is locally, um, is locally organized. Um, so that's a, um, uh, the, but there does seem to be a problem there. Um, Claire, uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Marius Frank, and then I'll go to you, Mike. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, there are things that can change, um, and that's in the Education Universal provision. I, I've put some comments in, in the chat pane about it. Schools can become more, uh, more inclusive, and uh, if they start to celebrate diversity and change their culture and climate, the bullying that was reported by Fiona was just unacceptable, completely, utterly unacceptable. And schools can move if there's a will to. And, um, you know, one of the problems, of course, is that school communities have for the past 20 years been judged on academic outcomes, not inclusive ones. And one of the things we can change rapidly is to change the way schools are judged. If schools are judged on their inclusivity, great things can happen and will happen quickly. And uh, I've put something in the chat, being a link to a course that I co-wrote, um, which is helping schools on that journey. I'll, I'll speak more later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike and then um, Suzanne Wickham. Uh, just to say, man, I think in general, we, we fear variability more than anything else in the health service. And you're just reiterating this across a complex area where we're meant to be cooperating and collaborating to make sure people get early diagnoses and early prescriptions about what is necessary. Now, at the moment, unless we have a national system that actually approaches that in a consistent way, we will always have the postcode lotteries that have been reported uh, from panelists today um, and that involves some education and some change in the curriculum for, for various health, uh, 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 health health workers who are at the moment not getting that input as to why it's important and coming back to Charles's point about which lens you look through it's quite easy 
to try and look through the most convenient lens because you've got something to do about it rather than looking this in a holistic way that there are several comorbidities going on here and you need to do something a little bit more coordinated. And perhaps we'll return to that later. Suzanne, over to you. Okay, Suzanne, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to really agree entirely with the comment just made about schools being more uh, accommodating and aware, etc. Um, I am sorry, I should have introduced myself. I am the portfolio holder for Send and Inclusion in Wiltshire Council. Um, we have a programme at the moment of um, encouraging and working with schools to work towards the British Dyslexia Association um, a quality mark and I understand there's something like 16 schools in the whole country that have this mark and we're working towards at least seven coming up in the future and I'm a portfolio holder I'm not involved in it in a personal level um, but I know the massive impact it has on uh, children and I'd love to see how we can actually promote this around the country because I think it is just from the very beginning it's the early help that could help, you know, so many children that we know suffer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Micheline, I hope Hi, Matt, thank you for doing this, this webinar. It's really important. My husband is dyslexic and he didn't know he was dyslexic. I didn't know he was dyslexic because he's been working as a um, commercial engineer repairing washing machines and would use the internet to help him through. And when we discovered, I thought it would be great for him to go to university or colleges. And it frustrated him because he would write things in a different way or he would see things in a different way. And though they said they were dyslexia friendly, they really wouldn't because he was graded and treated just like every other student. And it did put my husband in depression um, and at that point I was very very ill myself and he got really depressed and felt that he wasn't worthy um, and so I had to go to you know start with phonics and stuff he's much better he can write emails thanks to technology but it was really a crucifying period for him to identify I am dyslexic accept it but it had been missed completely and I'm so saddened that um, higher and further education though they um, say that they will embrace people who are dyslex um, suffering from dyslexia or are dyslexic I hate to use the word suffering because they're not suffering um, they need additional support system um, there isn't any um, every tool resources is the same grading is the same so I just want to say thank you for taking this on and anything I can do to help, I will. That's all. Thank you very much. I, the story that you tell is so familiar. I mean, it's what happened to me uh, and it, it is so familiar, this late identification, meaning people don't get the support that they need. What's really striking about this conversation is especially for those with more complex need who need, need EHCPs, um, even even when there is um, identification of a potential need, there is a huge postcode lottery in actually getting that, uh, that support. Um, and that is a, a, uh, a massive problem. Uh, Ruth Allen. Hi, yeah, thank you. So one of the things that kind of comes to mind when we're talking about sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion is the fact that there's gonna be implicit bias. And oftentimes that means that there needs to be some ongoing education in that area. Obviously, this is not about being someone with a stick and saying you're wrong, you're wrong. This is about educating people on how to not look at a person and decide that their behavior is because of their background or because of the color of their skin. And so the more we're able to have those conversations and call it what it is and try not to cover it up and get uncomfortable, the more likely we're able to break through some of the barriers and there's been lots of work done in different spaces maybe more collaboration needs to be done around the cultural perspective of dyslexia how that shows up and how to really embed 
different people's perspectives without them feeling like they're they're being othered. Um, so I think it's just really important to really call a spade a spade and say, hey, this is what's happening. This is how we break through rather than trying to sugarcoat it with something else because it, it just needs to have that clear, plain conversation. Yeah, thank you, Ruth Ellen. I think there's a lot in that. Uh, I think there's a lot in that. Um, I'm going to go to um, Brunner Tom and then Miles uh, Pilling. Um, Brunner. Hi, good night from Japan. So thank you so much. Um, I'm a researcher here in, in Japan. Uh, I'm a researcher like dyslexia so far, like in Japanese language. But it's quite a bit like complex, like to say to say. I came like from like physics area. So mathematics and physics. I started like to research because the numbers and the problems with the numbers in Japanese and also the numbers uh, in normal calculation. And I found like dyslexia. So uh, it, I, I, I don't suffer about that, but I, I know and I'm related for. Um, uh, the first problem about like dyslexia here in Asia, you know, you will say to that it's because like the translation for dyslexia in Japanese it means handicap so they are have like a really strong problem moral problem about uh you have like a problematic student but it, it's not like the thing right um I heard like before I'm sorry if I, I lost like who was about color and yes uh color was helping like me a lot with like some dyslexic uh, dyslexic uh students um however we need like to take care about like some color blind uh students and especially here is like one third so it's really important like we take care of like this um perspective um about like different languages yes and no sometimes could be like really tricky especially about like different language like japanese and english it's quite a bit tricky and yes uh, i'm right now i'm running like my startup we were trying like to test make a, like an app like to testing and like give like a better solutions for dyslexic people so we are trying like to do i will I, i'm open like to listen like everyone who has like any ideas and so on because i'm more for an have more statistic and mathematic area than dyslexia so if you have like any ideas uh, i'm more than welcome thank you thank you very much indeed um uh we, uh, we're going to go to miles pilling and then uh, and then pretty and then i'm going to wrap up this uh section and um uh, and hand the chair um over uh if we go to miles first and then pretty miles hi there matt thanks um i'm an assistive technologist i work in the area of technology to support pupils across a wide range of needs including dyslexia and one of the things that I think is very important, as it's been mentioned, is uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, going into schools, I, I often meet uh, IT departments who do not understand accessibility. Um, and the way to overcome it is to have uh, you know, systems in place that actually promote it from a central position, not just from companies, but from just, um, you know, organizations and uh, I just wonder if you could uh, promote the use of assistive technology in schools by widening the knowledge because this is a changing area as you know Matt and can you uh, influence maybe a central government organization to provide something like Bechter was to the field so that schools can find that information. Well, I look, I totally agree with you in terms of the um, uh, the need for uh, teachers to have proper training and that training has got to include the assistive technology uh, capabilities because they're they're um, you know, they, they can be so powerful. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I've seen a whole range of assistive technologies that can uh, can really help. I've got a pair of uh, glasses here that replicate the impact of um uh, of different color backgrounds uh for uh, for reading um and obviously the use of technology is made both to mitigate and to 
um, uh, uh, and to help uh, people to, um, especially to read, has been the transformation has been incredible in the last few years. So I, 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 you know, that it, it's got to be tied into the teacher training uh, piece, um, and I think that's absolutely critical to getting this getting this right. So I strongly agree with that, um, at Mars. Uh, can we go to we we'll go to Pretty, and then we're going to wrap up this uh, this section. Hi everyone, my name's Preeti. So um, I wear a few hats. I'm a researcher with Professor Stein, who's coined the magnocellular theory for dyslexia. Um, I'm an orthoptist, so my speciality is eyes and eye care and everything. Um, and I'm also the chair for visual processing difficulties with the British and Irish Orthoptic Society. So um, my speciality really is coloured lenses and visual stress and um, helping dyslexics overcome the visual challenges that are often associated with their um, reading and spelling difficulties. So um, like Claire said, 50% of children have the developmental language disorder, but uh, of not children, sorry, dyslexics, but also 50% of dyslexics do have a visual processing disorder as well. And this area is not getting even regulated or met in any way. So myself and, um, Dr Gilchrist, um, who sits on PATOS, are looking to create a regulatory body to um, regulate the visual stress industry or vision therapy industry. Um, so if anybody's got any ideas or we're thinking of creating a steering group, um, we want to be able to regulate the sector where everybody has to be singing from the same hymn sheet, doing the same assessments, providing the same treatment. Um, whether it's through NHS or private practice, um, because this is another whole sector that we haven't discussed in the first inquiry that I feel like we need to start looking at vision as well. Um, and again, you know, rich parents are able to access multiple assessments from multiple people with different varying like treatment. So if they don't like one, they can go to another. Whereas the children whose parents can't afford access to that treatment may get given a coloured overlay at best by their teacher at school. And again, it's just not fair. Like if I've got so much anecdotal evidence of how we've literally re, like transformed children's lives. So um, that's another area we need to look into if we're looking into in inclusion is a vision as well, please. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Preeti. Um, very clear. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, to Mike uh, to continue uh, to uh, chair this uh, this session and the other parts of the agenda. Uh, but before I go, I just want to say firstly, thank you all for your uh, contributions, both verbally and in the chat, which has been pretty lively. Um, the purpose of this Dyslexia Commission is, is both to air the issues, but also then to come forward with uh, clear, deliverable recommendations. Um, and I think this has been very helpful in surfacing some of the issues, in particular uh, around EHCP delivery. And given that there is a uh, the, the SEN review and green paper right now, um, and um, uh, thankfully the minister who's been running that process is uh, is is in remains in post. I say remains. He actually resigned and then was reappointed a day later. So, but that's um, uh, he is he's a he. Uh, Will Quince is really good at this, um, and I will reflect some of this discussion in Parliament uh, in the dis in my discussion with him uh, this afternoon. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I want to say uh, thank you. Uh, I leave you in uh, good hands, uh, Mike. Uh, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Matt, and, and thanks for your contribution this morning, and uh, thanks for making the time in what must be a pretty hectic day, and we wish you wisdom in your choice. Um, we move on to the uh, second and third uh, uh, parts of this uh, commission. Um, Matt has uh, identified the importance of coordination, and you've all contributed very, very thoroughly into that, uh, but it sort of builds into the next section, which is around integration. And we really would like to know what the people for people with dyslexia and other neurologically similar conditions, uh, what we would expect uh, the health service to provide, what integrated care service would provide, and how innovation and innovative technologies. And I was very interested to hear one of the contributions around assistive technologies and helping uh, overcome some of the problems related with neurodiverse conditions. Um, I run a master's course in 
uh, digital health and we're always looking for contributors from from patients or users of the system where uh, technology has helped them so if any of you want to contact me we can uh, try and get you as participants in, in that course um i think in the session we want to quite acquire some case studies if we can we're trying to it, it, it both look at the, the scope and the depth of those case studies, but also some of the positivity that's around in what can happen. Obviously, with a green paper being discussed in Parliament today, we're at a crossroads to this particular condition, and therefore this is a great opportunity uh, to, to highlight some of those uh, some of those wonderful case studies that you'll no doubt bring. So during this first session on, on integrated care, I'm going to first ask Debbie Hicks from the Reading Agency, followed by Ruth Bromley, to uh, give their own introductions. Um, and, and, and then perhaps we can start to look at some of the uh, background questions that you've asked. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe kick off the first one, but please do contribute in the chat. It's a very, very useful mechanism for getting points across, and I can bring you in uh, as Matt has done quite, quite skillfully in the first part of this. So, Debbie, may I hand over to you first, please? Thanks very much, Mike. So um, I'm creative director and founder of National Reading Charity, The Reading Agency. And I want to start by saying I'm not a dyslexia or send expert. Um, so I'm coming at, at this from a slightly different angle. What I am is a passionate reading activist with a long career in research and innovation aimed at ensuring the enormous benefits of reading are accessible to those that need them most. And there can be no doubt about the power that reading has. You know, we know from evidence Reading for pleasure is more important for children's cognitive development than their parents' education and is a more powerful factor in life achievement than socioeconomic background. So as a charity, our focus is on using this power to tackle big life challenges, building skills and learning, supporting health and well-being, overcoming loneliness and isolation. And we're absolutely committed to building inclusive reading communities accessible to everyone, including those who find reading difficult or who need targeted support. And we do this through national reading for pleasure programmes delivered at scale through public libraries in partnership with schools and other community settings. The work is evidence based, needs focused and quality assured. And whilst delivering massive reach, it's also targeting support where it's most needed. And our evidence shows that community and family focused reading activity can absolutely complement work in educational settings and make a real contribution to improving outcomes for children with dyslexia and um, SEND needs. Um, our Reading Well programme, Books on Prescription, um, it, it is a great example of this, particularly the two schemes supporting children and young people designed to build understanding of mental health and neurodiversity, support well-being and compact stigma through shared experience. The scheme involves the creation of evidence-based and quality assured reading lists delivered through a robust curation process that involves very extensive co-production with health professionals and, and um, people with lived experience. And this co-production mix is vital because it's very surprising how often the professional take on what works is different to that of the frontline user. So uh, it's a simple idea. Children, uh, our children and young people's book lists include age appropriate health informational, personal stories and fiction available to borrow from public libraries. It takes a non-clinical approach, uses accessible language and helps children to navigate tough times, difficult emotions, living with disabilities and uh, understanding specific conditions such as dyslexia, ASD, OCD and ADHD through brilliant books by brilliant authors. And the books are designed not only for children and young people who have SEND and dyslexia needs, but also for their friends and classmates to help build awareness and understanding. We ensure the content is included in a range of formats it's in sex, uh, so that it's accessible and inclusive. Titles are available for ebook library lending, so they're supported by dyslexia friendly fonts, their graphic and audio formats, and some titles have been written with dyslexia readers in mind. And the scheme is uh, endorsed by NHS England and health professional bodies. Uh, British Dyslexia UK supports reading well, um, and it, it's very well integrated um, in, into the support for this area of work and it's really easy to access it's free it's there in public libraries and it's meeting real need with three million public library loans to date uh, and 100 percent of children in a recent survey said they would recommend the book that they'd read to others and 65 percent of young people said they felt better because of reading um, a, a title from the scheme so reading well is a targeted mental health and well-being intervention but our commitment to providing support through reading for children with send and dyslexia needs is integrated 
across all areas of our work. So we recently created an autism reading for pleasure book list for children and young people in collaboration with Autistic UK, a fantastic collection of books by autistic authors representing a diverse range of experience, voices and, and, and stories. And our Summer Reading Challenge, this country's biggest reading for pleasure programme delivered through public libraries, reaches over 700,000 children with fun summer reading activity that helps to build confident and engaged readers. We offer accessible materials, ensure that dyslexia friendly titles are included on the book list along with e and audiobook formats to make sure that everyone can have fun taking part spurred on by incentives and a completion medal while also benefiting from the positive outcomes of reading enjoyment confidence and behavior and evidence also shows that taking part in the challenge improves well-being reduces stress builds creativity and imagination. In fact, in a recent report, a mother of one dyslectic child states, the reading challenge has been amazing. It's really helped to push my daughter's reading. She's more confident in class and it shows that reading really does help. So I just wanted to finish with what I think our work suggests are successful strategies in helping children with dyslexia and SEND needs access the benefits and of enjoyment of reading. Co-production is key to ensuring that we're meeting real need and affecting real change. For example, one young person with dyslexia told us that a book that we were looking at, um, the contrast between the colour background and the font wasn't accessible. We chose another title, fed back to the publisher who agreed to make changes. We also know that books are made for sharing. All the evidence shows that reading together in families, in libraries, in classrooms and in reading groups can really help reluctant readers build interest and engagement, explore feelings and concepts, develop community and build social connections. Different formats are important too. Audiobooks, for example, are a great way into stories, helping children to develop listening and concentration, learn new words, new ideas, and new ways of using language. Reading apps and e-readers also play a part in making text accessible, although I think nothing really beats being read to whatever your age. Choice is vital to building identity as a reader, and sometimes this means choosing to reread familiar texts to build familiarity with words and letters. And finally, let's not forget the contribution that public libraries can make to an exclusive reading offer. Their skilled staff, free physical and digital resources, active community partnerships, and work to ensure their trusted community spaces are accessible to those with SEND and dyslexia needs helps make programmes such as the Summer Reading Challenge and Reading Well available to all. I wanted to just end by saying reading is absolutely both a mirror and a window of the world. It enables children to learn new things, to meet new people, visit new places. It helps them to see themselves and to share experiences, to build empathy and understanding, to feel better and to find their way in the world. Reading really does change lives, which is why we work to ensure its benefits reach those that need them most. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sherry. Um, that was a tour de force of why we all need our libraries <laughs> and the, the narrative and the reading that, that comes from, that, that, that enhances and enriches our lives, but especially those who perhaps were, were forgotten about and, and could not access such, such a beautiful narrative in, in their lives. And what you've told us there and that co-production side of it, I think, actually is a, a really important thing in, in just about everything I do. If you don't ask the people who are affected by it, what they want from it, how on earth will you know what to, what's going to happen? We'll, we'll come back to some of those themes in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to move on to, to Ruth Bromley now. Thank you, uh, Ruth, for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Um, so my name's Ruth Bromley. I'm a GP in Withinshaw in South Manchester and have worked my entire GP career. Um, in that locality. It's a very large council estate and I am absolutely passionate about the people that I have the privilege to serve, but it does have many of the challenges that we find in areas of deprivation within our country. I'm also the lead for ethics and law at Manchester Medical School with a background in health inequalities and resource allocation. And every time I think I've managed to simplify where we target resource in my mind, another challenge is thrown into the mix. And I think today is a good example of that. So I'm really enjoying the conversation and learning a great deal. Until the 30th of June, I was the chair of Manchester Health and Care Commissioning, so responsible for a £1.2 billion budget and providing health care resource, but concurrently was part of the Greater Manchester um, Health and Social Care Partnership, which is, was a preliminary devolved partnership. So I'm going to share some examples from our working and from my time as a board member on our Children and Young People's Board in Greater Manchester. But just to put this into context, I think, because it helps particularly from a healthcare commissioning perspective, 
from my reading, one in 10 children, and therefore I assume one in 10 adults have dyslexia, and 30% of those um, children or adults will also have another co-occurring um, condition, which I'm hearing you talk about today. And I was thinking about as a GP, how that resonates into my population. And again, there are lots of themes from what um, some of you have shared already, but particularly around poverty and the impact that has on people's ability to access support and the way that the children that I'm resp responsible for are often um, marginalised further because of compounded harm. So they may have a diagnosis of ADHD, they may be experiencing trauma, and obviously there's a very close link between trauma behaviours and ADHD presentation. And then they may come from family backgrounds where their parents find it much more challenging to access and um, support needs. So I hear that in some of the stories I've heard, we do a lot of work supporting families, parents and children with mental health problems and anxiety that may stem from some of the challenges they're facing both at school and out of school. And I've also got quite extensive experience in complex safeguarding. And I think I heard some of those themes coming through and that's something we've really tried to work across our pan-sector relationships in Greater Manchester. As a um, member of the Greater Manchester Children and Young People's Board, which started as John Rouse became our chief officer, and it was something, some really important work that John um, prioritised um, at a time perhaps when children and young people's voices weren't being heard so loudly elsewhere in the country. So we had really good structures put in place. And one of the things that he created was a very large board structure where co-production was absolutely at the centre of everything. There was about 100 people at our main meetings, which included children and family members and carers um, who were involved in all manner of different aspects of children's health. And there was a very strong um, focus upon school readiness, upon helping children with challenges whilst in education and looking very holistically at the wider sort of support network that children needed. We have very high levels of um, safeguarding need as well as um, additional learning needs across Greater Manchester. So that was at the heart of all of our conversations, whether we were talking about asthma, whether we were talking about school readiness, whether we were talking about our criminal justice um, services. And, and what was probably most powerful about that process of sitting alongside partners who worked across the public sector with, within the council and from the um, sort of more business elements of our communities was really the conversations and the human element of those interactions. So learning to really understand things, either from those with lived experience and those struggling within our current systems, but also understanding that when I'm frustrated by something one of my colleagues might be doing, for example, in the police force, where they're problematizing a child's behavior, I started to have much more empathy and understanding for the challenges they were facing because the teenager that I saw in my consulting room wasn't necessarily behaving in the same way at the point of arrest into police services. So I did quite a lot of work with the police around looking after young adults in custody and thinking about them as children rather than children who are criminals. And that's been some really powerful work that we've done. The other bit of work that I do is around homeless health care, and I've led on that in Greater Manchester over the last five years. And the intersection of compounded deprivation, compounded harm, and unfortunately, the very visible sort of um, harm that can be seen in people who end up sleeping on our streets, where you'll see a much greater proportion of people who are street sleeping experiencing trauma and um, have, have had very um, challenged childhoods and often do have either a learning difficulty or a learning disability as well as a mental health problem. So we've worked really hard to understand what our services need to do to adapt to meet the needs of those that are most disadvantaged using psychologically informed environments and trauma responsive techniques to try and align our services to meet the needs of people with multiple disadvantage. Just finally, a bit more locally to Manchester, throughout the pandemic, we've absolutely prioritised our health inequalities work around people with greatest need. And we've used sounding boards, working in partnership with communities, and we've used communities of identity as well as, as communities of geography, led by Black Lives Matters and the need to tackle racism and racial injustice in the NHS but also with a very strong focus on learning difficulty and learning disability and absolutely adopting the social model of disability. So what do I need to do differently to create a fair and equitable service for the people that I am responsible for? 
I think that's everything really except to say I feel really uplifted by this conversation I think there's huge potential I think my neurodivergency shows me that there's many parallels between other conversations I'm having and I think we could get a much louder voice behind some of this work if we drew it into the leveling up conversations should they persist beyond a new leader of the Conservative Party but also just thinking generally about health inequalities all of the work that we need to do in the NHS and in our ICS moving forward. And then also thinking about how we bring in the voices of people on this call and elsewhere with, with lived experience to turn up the volume on, on dyslexia specifically. So thank you for having me here. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all of your work that you're doing in this area. And by the sounds of it, in many other areas, in, I, I know your area very well, I speak. Uh, regional medical virus in the north of England, so spent a lot of time in Manchester at, at that point. I think it's important, some of the points that you've raised there, the, the sort of recurrent themes, I, I guess the recurrent themes in many of the things we talk about in such commissions, about social inequalities, about access to care, about people with multiple problems and coming um, from a lens from different aspects of society, be it from crime, be it from mental health, be it from general practice, be it from education, be it from social care. And, and the highlight you made around homelessness, I think, is a very apt one. Whenever you look at the needs of homelessness, homeless people, much as in other areas as well in the country, there, there's so much unmet need. So highlighting the thing that might help them climb the ladder away from that, I think is, is an important uh, aspect of the work that you're doing and, and others. Can I just ask a question of you? Um, I, I, this is my 43rd year in, as a doctor, um, and I've been through so many reorganizations, I've lost count. Um, I think for the last 20 years, I've advocated integrated care in whatever role I've had. Are you involved with the integrated care systems in the primary care networks? And do you think they will get a hold on these complex issues? Is that something that you look forward to or are you skeptical? Um, it's an honesty case, <laughs> it's safe. So, so um, I am currently displaced by having invested a good proportion of the last eight years of my life in the health inequalities of Dr. Sophie. ICS transformation has not yet been kind to me. Um, I have hope for PCNs, but I think they need support and resource. And I think we need to redefine what business as usual is in primary care particularly. Um, I think one of the challenges we've had in um, Greater Manchester was actually devolving budgets. So I might make an intervention in health, which creates a saving somewhere else in the system, but that saving isn't realized in my working existence. So there's something about how we value goodwill and where we share resource. And I hope, that's my one hope, that we will get that right in the, in the next step in Greater Manchester. What's been interesting is I've been on a lot of national calls recently of, of people that are starting up. And I think it would be really good to be more involved to try and help people speed through some of the things that we learned by experience where we can get much more quickly to the crux of the matter, I think, if we work together on it, you know, nationally to devise what plans we want. Thank you very much. I'd like to see some hands, please, for comments on this area, and also some more comments in the chat if I could, and then it will direct me to areas that are important to you and the people who are involved in this care more. Um, Graham Huggins, are you wanting to uh, uh, come in about uh, your, you, you've been chatting to me around assistive technologies, and thank you for the uh, support that uh, you, you're offering in terms of my own work. Um, but in terms of uh, how people are going to access uh, assistive technologies, do you see this sort of coordinated approach to integrated care as being, as being helpful? Or, or real even? I'm going to come back to Debbie until some of you get brave again. Um, I, Mike, you've got um, Gina and you've got Marius with hands. Oh, sorry, it's not coming up on my screen. Sorry. I do. I thought I might just direct you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, Marius. <clears throat> Is that me, Mike? Sorry. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I, I've worked uh, for the last uh, five or six years with youth offending teams around the country, and of course, the collision of of undiagnosed needs feeding if you like, pathways into youth justice is, is, is awful. Uh, but one of the things we are, we are pushing forward is, is better partnership working. And through that partnership working, it is getting local authority partnerships 
to appreciate complex needs, which is a collision between health needs, um, um, uh, special educational needs, but also structural disadvantage. And, and once a complete picture, and if you like a journey that a child has been on, as people have mentioned before, uh, ACEs, um, as well as social, the social and emotional impact of disadvantage. Um, it allows you to start to prioritise resource around those, those young people. And the work that Ruth was doing absolutely fundamentally triangulates with that approach, an appreciation of, uh, of health equality, uh, inequality, but also, um, if you like, uh, ascending inequality and also the structural disadvantage that young people have. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Gina? Um, yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I really enjoyed what you had to say there. Um, it was quite insightful. Um, myself, I was hidden homelessness. Um, so um, even though I did have early intervention, um, so my comments um, might go off the subject. It's more to directly to Gillian Ashley. Um, but also mainly um, to see if there's anybody actually present that is actually to do with the dyscalculia side of things as well. Um, because as much as you will, um, you know, I have benefited, I have done okay, um, but, you know, there has been um, research done, there are facts that dyscalculia is definitely a, a factor in it, um, in um, the care of what happens to um, a young child or young person um, in education and also when the opportunities if they want to um, find employment or to at least be able to um, get by in life um, so my my comment really is um, what is there anybody actually from the dyslexia, dyscalculia side of things? Because I can see that the dyslexia is very much a focus and, and it's very good, it's very strong, it's very there, but obviously there are things that have fallen away. Uh, well, I don't know if it's seen as laziness, <laughs> um, Bruna Tom, um, but I um, do want to, um, I would like someone to kind of say, um, you know, because if it's not the reading and the writing, that's that's um, not a problem or it's been managed. What new um, practice, because what I was given to to understand mathematics and numeracy, it, it didn't always work. And then we're also seeing people that have the basics, not the lacking the basics, but when it comes to things like um, calculus and really hard things that are quite over my head, uh, you know, my question is, um, is also, I need to kind of speak to somebody from that area again. How do they go from where they are to what they're doing now? Um, and so I really like to be able to, to see that as much as you will have a reading agency, but also to have, I know there's a numeracy um, agency or something like that. Um, there should be something also, um, because I kept trying to make up every time, um, working in retail, working in offices. Um, and it wasn't 10 years ago to be accountable and take responsibility because I did disastrously in jobs that needed numeracy. Um, and it didn't matter if I had um, a degree or, or, or went to a really good university. Um, the dyscalculia isn't going to go away. It's not going to just vanish just like um, dyslexia. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's my comment and my questioning as well. Um, and also the other thing is 10 years ago I went to um, employability open day and I found that the majority of the people that were there 10 years ago it was a long time ago was majority from a privileged background and who were dyslexic and I felt that kind of um, you know it didn't really put me in I more or less walked away like well I'm not exactly rich um, and it, it 
you know, we really need to kind of, you know, these job centres need to kind of, um, I mean, they're doing great jobs, the DWP in some areas, but it would have been really good. Um, I don't know, I, I was quite, not disappointed, but it, it's just, I'm just thinking what is happening now for the people that ha- over the last 10 years, what's happened to them when they go to things like employ- employability. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, people. Thank you very much, Gina, and thank you for your story. Uh, but also, I think you've highlighted the fact that, you know, we're, we're talking about dyslexia today, but the, but the whole spectrum here of, of problems uh, where people face employability issues uh, is well made. And I hope that what you've said will resonate with a lot of people who are researching in this area to look at how we can best prepare people who are looking at future employment to young people uh, to overcome some of these, these issues. Uh, Debbie, I'm just going to come back to you briefly uh, on, on sort of the, uh, the, the sort of coordinated approach to this. You mentioned in your in your last uh, 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 chat uh, around some successes in that area. Could you just uh, give us some background on that? Yes, I think we've been very aware that um, quite often children only take can only take part in our programmes if they um, if their parents take them to the library, um, and and that those children who um, are living with disadvantage there might be all sorts of barriers to the reason to, for, and reasons why they can't um, you know make a library visit so uh, this year uh, last year we we piloted approaching 10 library authorities where we connected up agencies across the authority so that meant libraries working with education with children's services with public health um, to um, to come together to um, reach out to children in the community um, so that they could, it was focused around the summer reading challenge so that instead of coming into the library, they could start the challenge um, in uh, in their schools, in their classrooms or um, in their uh, in their half program setting. Um, and they had an automatic library card and quite often the public library would, um, at the, the school library would provide books to get them started. And we've seen 100,000 additional children take part in the summer reading challenge as a result of that initiative. Many of whom were not library users um, and wouldn't have taken part previously. So I think it is those cross authority partnerships, bringing agencies together to integrate support um, and reach uh, and, and target uh, interventions. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, Claire uh, has just posted uh, from the DWP, you work with the DWP, Claire Connor. Um, I, I just wondered whether you could say what resources you would like to be able to help in this area. I know you find them personally it's been difficult very difficult during uh, COVID, uh, but perhaps you could just sort of say what it is that would make a difference. Basically, I'm a work coach, um, so I see customers day in, day out. Um, there are gaps in provision. We've, we ask our district offices if they can help, but we're told that if there isn't the demand, they can't put on a course or they can't put on a provision. And usually the problem we've got, especially around neurodiverse conditions, is there are so many um, different organisations that want to get a finger in the pie, shall we say, when it comes to a government contract and money being awarded. How can I be? How can I be polite? Um, they, I don't think there's any need to be polite. Just uh, <laughs> they usually <laughs> will end up getting some of the over the years I've done the job some of the providers shall we say are more in tune with lining their own pockets than helping our customers and obviously being where I am I'm frontline in a job center my hands are tied I don't get to influence decisions I just get to feed it back up the line when people are complaining to me so So, so you're saying there's a, there's a problem with the procurement of such services and value for money from them. I think some people on, on, on the chat are agreeing with you quite strongly on that. I'm going to bring yes. this section to a close now, and it'll really just seamlessly go into the next section around of taking place technologies. But thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you very much, Ruth. But please feel free to contribute to, to the next section as we go on. Um, we're trying to discuss here about improving access and uptake of the latest technology for people with dyslexia. But I think there's a broader thing here. A lot of the people who don't uptake with latest technologies, and particularly assistive technologies, are probably the one with the greatest need. And I think several people have already highlighted the fact that 
And, and, and Gina, I think, made a great point where, earlier on when, when she went to the event 10 years ago that there are a lot of people that are already getting multiple inputs, but actually the people who were getting no inputs were nowhere to be seen. And, and I suppose that's just a logical statement, but in essence, you, you, you're not reaching out to people who actually may have the greatest need. And I, I hope that the new technologies we're having um, certainly don't do that. And, and coming back to um, who, who, Ruth, you were saying you were leading on ethics in this, and I think there's a, a core issue here around uh, around uh, the access and, and, and societal need and how new top technologies are actually distributed so that you, you can uh, upturn that inverse care law that we, we seem to be bound to for the majority of majority of time. So I'm going to move on to the opening statements of the four contributors here and, and Chrissy Franklin from Safe Learning Specialist Academy of Transformation Trust. Can, can we come to you first and then I'll come to uh, Marius uh, again who's contributed earlier and Andy Salmon. Hi everybody, hope to find you well and in some sunshine. Unfortunately it appears we're all indoors at the moment. So um, I'm Chrissy Franklin, I'm an independent researcher and I'd like to really talk about the research I've took on part on behalf of a assistive technology company called Scanning Pens Limited, um, which has enabled me to see exactly what Mike's just mentioned, which are those blocks to access and why those blocks have potentially appeared. And I think what my research has really been showing and proving to me is that it depends what that, that um, service is offering. So my research has been within prisons, it's been within um, an aphasia um, patients, and it's been with prison officer training. So there's three quite distinctive different arenas that I've done research in as alongside primary and secondary schools. And for the adult side, it is about what that service is. So for prisons, the block, the difficulties of accessing assistive technology is the obvious, security, and then the secondary underlining issue that is often not discussed is about the difficulties of overcoming why a prisoner is in the prison environment. So my personal viewpoint is that the sentence length is the punishment and the subsequent rehabilitation and support is what happens within the prison environment. So blocks can be the assistive technology, the concepts of um, Wi-Fi, security and so on and so forth. So Producing and introducing assistive technology that's not reliant on Wi-Fi, I felt was a, as a winner, but it took me many years to get through the doors with, with a reading pen to actually see how that supported. When we did actually enable us to get in that environment with the assistive technology, we saw a great, huge change in concept of self, in self-identity, in achievement, in independent learning, alongside the support of, obviously, the tutors and the teachers in that prison environment. What was markedly was sometimes the assumptions of tutors and the assumptions of the other adults within that environment in that assistive technology was going to actually make them redundant and not needed, which is far from the case. Assistive technology will always need a tutor and somebody that believes in what is occurring, what is happening to actually walk alongside that. With the aphasia patient, I noticed that the, the block is about the clinical need, it's about the medical need, it's about when that person's going to be leaving the environment of the hospital, what is the focus? The focus will be on their clinical day-to-day -day living. But there is research that is indicative that 90% of aphasia patients want to return to who they were before the stroke, before the aphasia. And therefore, a, a rounded actual question would be, what was important to you? And for the aphasia patients I met, being able to read independently was what was important to them. Being able to access assistive technology that they could utilise, bearing in mind that some of them would have a weakness down one up the side, bearing in mind that their capacity to talk would be limited. So assistive technology that was going to enable them to, en to enable part of their recovery, not just the clinical medical side. And I think the blocks for adults that are returning or starting in a new course of work for instance, the prison officer training courses, there is an assumption that the, the learner will tell another adult or will tell the actual teaching programme, will tell the tutors within that programme that they have a learning difficulty. And actually, they won't because there is still stigma. There is still issues with actually admitting as an adult, you have a learning difficulty. So it's about 
but actually going back to those that are supplying that education, that are supplying that support, that are supplying that force and asking, are you asking a full rounded amount of questions, not just about the obvious, you know, you have aphasia, you need to be able to be mobile. It's about actually understanding what the adult wants to gain from that. And when they do gain that, that capacity or that access to assistive technology, what I found was a huge, huge amount of self-confidence improvement, a huge amount of impact on their emotional well-being, their mental well-being, but also the capacity to join it back in within the community. And if we look at prisons particularly, that's one of our biggest aims is to actually bring back into community, to step back into the community. So I did mention briefly that I'd also done research in primary school. And what I did within that environment was introduce assistive technology to every child within that classroom, not just the child with dyslexia or neurodiversity, but every single child within that environment. And what I hoped to do by doing that was actually not levering the playing field or any of that lovely educational talk that's given. I actually wanted us to have common ground and understanding of what that assistive technology could do to us, for us as an individual, but also to enable them to understand why that assistive technology was helpful to others. And actually, if we gain that knowledge from, from childhood and carry that through into our adult environments and our adult lives, we hopefully will be able to actually reduce those issues we're facing today, which is the adults that are in charge, the adults that are the stakeholders and the policy makers, deciding what that group of adults or learners need and actually forgetting to have those conversations about what the learner wants to achieve. So the blocks may not necessarily be the obvious of finances, the blocks may actually be assumptions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Chrissy. I'm, I'm just gonna move on to uh, Ruth Ellen Danko, who you, you commented earlier on about some of the cultural issues. And I'm sure you're going to mention those again now, uh, but your role is as Chief Innovation Officer. So perhaps you can give us your view now. Yeah, so I do assessments um, for people in the workplace. And some of the challenges that occur when people are accessing the tools is some of the technology that is already out there that's been existing for a while just isn't fit for purpose. So we've got um, people that aren't able to articulate themselves as well because of the self-esteem that has impacted them too. So for example, we've got um, disparities between the advisors as well, like within that access to work and how they kind of speak to people. And you've got the challenges with the assessors who, who are quality is so different between the two and it all impacts the way an individual feels like they've almost re been re-traumatized throughout the whole process and so technology can definitely help to mitigate some of those challenges that come up um, and support a person but if a person's unable to even access it because of all the barriers then it's almost uh, becomes an oxymoron it just doesn't make sense for them to even go through the process especially by the time they get to the end they're told abruptly you haven't got this funding um some some people have used c pens which is great for them but then if we looked at it from an intersectional point of view there's people that have challenges with steady hands i've had a client before who uses c pen and said it doesn't work for them because they need something that helps with their steady hands so we had to then look at all cam now technology is always evolving and I think what happens as well is lots of people are old school. They don't look at the, the new technology that's coming in. They don't see how the person is from a holistic point of view. Uh, and that's a challenge as well, because if you're just counting them as, oh, well, it's a tick box exercise, rather than listening to the person in that assessment, holding space, that container, then what happens is that person goes away and doesn't feel seen, heard, or valued throughout their own process. Um, so I think, there needs to be some form of equity in the process of when you are doing workplace needs assessments for people so that people feel like they're fairly treated. Um, there needs to be some training on, on people to make sure that they aren't bringing in a biases in to the conversation and they are listening to people. And when it comes to the technology piece, there has to be some form of, is this technology gonna help or hinder that person? Uh, for example, Dragon, really good for some people. Other people, it's a complete nightmare because of the way it is, um, you need training on it and needs to get used to your voice. Where something like Otter, 
which isn't traditionally an assistive technology piece, um, helps the person to still access those meetings and get um, really focused and clear as to what happened in those meetings and dictate as well. So I, from, from doing lots of assessments, doing lots of training and coaching for people that are neurodiverse, it's very evident that there's a massive gap in quality and, and, and there's an inequality when it comes to the way technology is actually, I guess, not only advertised to people, but also allocated to them. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you mentioned several things there that are very pertinent to the current agendas in procuring new technologies. And that is, I, I, I get canvassed a lot by companies that want to introduce new technologies in healthcare, be it robotics, AI, and a whole series of other things. Uh, but they never look from the point of view of the lens of the person who ended up being the user of that, be it, be it the patient, be it the doctor, be it the clinician that's involved in it. And they, if they've not done co-design and worked out what it is that's needed, the chances are it will fail. So you've got to go back to the start again. And what you're highlighting there is that not every tool is useful to everyone. Uh, and to be inclusive, you need a variety of uh, assistive technologies that can help you. That was very, 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 very helpful. Thank you very much. I I'm just going to go on now and then we'll come back later, Ruth, to some of the po points you've made. Uh, if I could move to Andy. And uh, Andy, you've got a couple of videos to show us as well. Is that correct? I have. Thank you very much. Um, right, road to learning tends to be the, the, the method people try to use to learn facts, whether it's the capital of Sweden or a history date or the spelling of something or a times table, it tends to be the usual one, which is dull, uh, it takes time, it doesn't really work. Um, whereas the, the world of animation is now changing that, it's changing the landscape, literally, uh, especially for people with dyslexia and dyscalculia, are you pleased to hear, Gina? Uh, because letter sequencing uh, is a problem, of course. So what you need to do, you need to take off the page, the letters, and animate them. And rather than having them looking in the here and trying to get the letter order, you animate them, make it a picture or a, a little film clip, and it knocks the barrier down. I just want to show you one example here, which I should have done, should have sent to, uh, just so you can just see this. Okay, so the children know it's the, uh, oh, there's a cup in the biscuit. There's a cup in the biscuit. And away we go. It's knocking down this barrier. Animation is definitely the way forward. And by doing this at such a young age, this problem that children, the word is problem with dyslexia, which is a big fat no as far as I'm concerned. But if they're getting naught out of 10 because of dyslexia and their spelling tests, it is a problem. I appreciate that. But by doing this, by creating this world of animation and bringing words to life, it's now, not, it's now not a problem because children with dyslexia, it works for them. It doesn't matter what's in their head and how they process things. It works for them. This is a whole class thing. That walk of shame, the poor children have to walk out with the walk of shame for a special session. It's all gone. It is all gone. Let me show you two clips here. Uh, there's a lady called Wendy um, who did a case study, 120 children. And a lot of these children are, are neurodiverse. She did a case study for a couple of weeks, and then I'll show you also uh, a teacher's feedback, uh, only 20 seconds, on what she thought of uh, the impact that link, linking, linking, I so link a lot because I like to link a lot, but the technique of linking, which has been out there forever, uh, the impact it's having on children, and you'll love her glasses, by the way, they're fantastic glasses because it's, it's a Christmas time. These are back-to-back -back two clips, okay? So one class used to link a lot, and one class didn't. So one class did the normal sort of thing that we'd normally do, look, cover, write, check, pyramid writing, whilst the other class was using Selink a lot. And the pre-experiment uh, scores were very similar. All scored probably maybe two or three. And then at the end of the week, we did a test and most of the children scored somewhere between 15 and 20. And the children in the non um, as a link a lot classes were scoring four or five, six. And then a week later, we did the same test again, but so link a lot wasn't used. Nobody practiced the spellings again. Our scores actually went up because some of the children who, although they weren't having to practice, they wanted to carry on looking at the link a lot because they enjoyed it so much. Does the link a lot work? Yes! yes! The children have just loved it. That short 
flip every morning. They come in and it's a link a lot time. And they've really made uh, progress, particularly the lower ones, I think, to see their little faces and to start to see that they've started to believe in themselves and, oh, actually, I can do it. And they're actually repeating the animations. So it's, it's had a huge impact. They did a before and after, two and a half, uh, 20 words, difficult words. Do you want to carry on playing it, Ben? That's all right. You talk, it goes, you see. That's the problem. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I won't talk, which is not a bad thing for the next 30 seconds. Carry on playing that. Andy, we're not able to see it at the moment. I'm afraid. You can't see it? Uh, no, it's... Uh, it's yeah, sorry, I think Andy, the uh, tech okay, don't worry. Uh, what defeated me on this one. I apologise on that. Uh, don't worry about it, the, it's okay. Uh, slide, if you want me to. Okay, well, we'll ask you to talk us through the... Pro the, the yeah, the, okay. The, the, it was 120 children, year three, year six, 20 very, very difficult words, like definitely onomatopoeia manoeuvre, killer words like that. They were tested before. The average 120 children was two and a half out of 20. They did a week of Selinkalot, 60 children with Selinkalot, 60 without doing rote learning, you know, pyramid writing, look, say, cover up, check, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they, the children without went from two and a half to five. So link a lot, two and a half to 17. A week later, no one used to link a lot, no one used rote learning. The five went down to four. So link a lot went up to 18 because the children went home and wanted to look at so link a lot more. It's amazing what's happening. The whole thing is giving children confidence, which is very exciting. I don't know if you can actually show the case study too. We'll try it one more time, Ben, but there's no clip here. It's just a still. So I think you've got a chance, Ben. I think that's within your remit. I think you can do that one. The, the case study two. <laughs> that's all right. The tech was working earlier on. I will promise you that as well. Okay. We, we tested it as well. But I can well, 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 don't worry. Uh, wait, okay, do a case study two. Uh, right, you can... If you look at the middle, you'll see before and after the SEN and PP children. They improved more than the, the other children without who were not sent in PP, which is very exciting. For them, it's, it's, it's a game changer and they really grasp it. Okay, that, that's fine, but that's fine. It's okay. Um, what's very exciting about linking, thinking of links, never eat shredded weeds, big elephants because are you lucky duck, this sort of thing. It's been out there forever. I've just grabbed it like no one else has, is the children who find learning tricky are really good at thinking of links because rote learning doesn't work for them. So they've had to explore their imagination to commit something to memory. And they are seasoned linkers. They send their tricks to us. We put them up in the app. Children have got dyslexia are getting their name on the spelling app and getting a credit. They are very creative children. So you think normally dyslexia is actually a weakness. Now you have, forgive the expression, Chrissy, level the playing field by every child using uh, this learning tool. Their, their, their weakness now becomes a strength because they are now helping children with, to learn facts, whether it's times tables, anything, because they've got a great, or they've used their imagination before, which is really, really exciting. Two more things very quickly. Key stage one is the time to do this. The earlier you can help children, all ages, using the same resource, the less chance they will derail later on. And at key stage one, they're not getting wound up about their learning. They're not, they're not thinking, hold it, I'm rubbish at this. It's key stage two when that kicks in. Their, their friends may take the mick out of them and stuff like that, which is obviously unfair. Do it in key stage one, and then away you go. So rather than saying like um, years ago, I'm left footed, or I'm left handed, that's a problem. It's not anymore. Now with this, because dyslexia is working, it works for every child, dyslexia or no dyslexia, saying I'm dyslexic is not an issue. It's fine. In fact, it's actually a bonus, right? Um, I think that's what I'm done. Uh, one last thing, people say to me, um, embrace dyslexia. Dyslexia is a wonderful thing. Children are not going to buy into that until they get 10 out of 10 in their spelling. When they get 10 out of 10 in their spelling, then you've got their ear, their ear okay? And one last thing, I love Matt's stat, Matt Hancock's stat about prison and entrepreneurs because people have got, there's a high percentage of uh, dyslexics in prison and a high percentage of entrepreneurs. They're both here. Some go that way, some go that way. If you get them on track early on, they all go that way. And for you, for Fiona... With 90% of the children, it's confidence. So link a lot, so, so not silly, I'm not trying to plug my, sorry, my app, forgive me. Linking, trying to find connections, gives that confidence. There are no rules, no system, nothing. And last thing I want to say is, Debbie, I do love reading is the mirror and the window of the world. That is, I don't know if that's your one, but it's a fantastic one I'm going to use in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, both for the content and the entertainment. And I'm sorry there was a slight hiccup with one of, one of the uh, inputs there. However, you make some brilliant points, and I think some of the uh, uh, 
examples you're giving are going to form the basis of case studies that as a positive affirmation for what you can achieve if you're given the right support and right technologies. Uh, Marius, I'm going to come to you uh, uh, last in this section. You're head of education at Microlink, and uh, we've heard a little bit from you before, but don't be bashful. Introduce yourself fully. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. How do I follow you, Andy? That was really un that was really unfair. Anyway, I will do my best. Unlucky, um, all right? Unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Marius. I've had a wonderful journey through education, 30 years, which includes uh, 10 years of um, a headship of a school that served an era of outstanding natural deprivation, as I like to describe it. Uh, also CEO of Asdan Education, worked for Achievement for All, and now at Microlink. But before that, um, I did uh, six years of uh, uh, neurobiology and neurophysiological research. And I have to say, studying mice and rats was the best preparation for headship you could possibly have imagined. Um, I'd like to finish this session being relentlessly positive. Uh, and Ben, could you share my slide just for a second, please? That would be so, so good. Um, I would love you uh, to see um, this young lady. Um, this is Joanna. Uh, she's a year nine student uh, with a number of, of needs and a detailed EHCP plan. This is her enjoying the use uh, of immersive reader for the first time on her computer. And I hope you can see a smile behind that mask. Um, I'm absolutely privileged to have uh, designed and delivered uh, a, 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 a DFE funded assistive technologies pilot that involved teachers from over 80 uh, primary schools and secondary schools in England. We did it earlier this year. Um, it was wonderful. Thanks. You can stop sharing now, Ben. That, 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 that's, that's wonderful. Um, the assistive technologies pilot helped a set of teachers to first of all appreciate what assistive technology could do and then apply it in the classroom. Now, uh, you might think that was easy, uh, but actually to get uh, teachers today to to add something new to their uh, toolkit was was quite uh, quite a, a challenge. So we went back in terms of, uh, if you like, inclusion by design, concentrating on three things. First of all, the training instilled insights. It then went on to motivate goal behave orientated behavior, develop their te techniques and then embedded practice. It was all standard stuff. But today we have an extraordinarily um, uh, powerful set of tools which are available to anyone uh, and it is free. What some of the big tech giants have done is put some immense processing material up on the cloud, which can be drawn down for free. Um, some of you might have heard of Immersive Reader. Um, now, the cloud-based version of Immersive Reader is truly unbelievable. And now, you don't need to buy into Office 365 to get it. If you use an app like Helperbird, the free version of Health of Bird, you can get all the power of Immersive Reader onto a mobile phone, onto uh, a desktop, a laptop, a Chromebook, uh, 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 an Apple Mac, anyone could use it. And the change was fantastic. Within two weeks, we had reports back of young people. And again, uh, Andy, the age group is absolutely right. Key stage one, key stage two. Uh, this was from a teacher who, who was working with an eight-year-old who would constantly complain, why am I always behind? Why do I always finish? Why do everyone finish their task before I have a chance to, to read it? And and the teacher said, how about if I put this app on your phone? She go, he goes, what, what, what? Then, then she pointed to the books and she said, what book do you want to read? And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, what book do you want to read? He goes, that one. Opened up the book, put the, lap, put the uh, pad over the, the book and he goes, it's reading it to me. It's reading it to me. Oh, this is amazing. I can keep up with everyone. How can I have it at home? At the age of eight, he was suddenly excited at the possibility of not having an adult reading to him, but he was empowered to, to read uh, and access the curriculum himself. There are possibilities. There are possibilities now. Um, and it's possibilities that go beyond um, the possible in classes. At the moment, there is a diagnosis needed uh, to get help. 
But as the British Dyslexia Association have said, 70 to 80% of young people with dyslexia in our classrooms today go unnoticed. But what if uh, the use of assistive technologies grew to the point that they were used as ubiquitously in the classroom as a pen or a piece of paper? If we open up the possibilities in the classroom to make that happen, then more young people's needs will be met and they will start learning that journey to independence as Andy, as many of you have said before, at the age of seven, eight and nine. And yes, we need to move the whole system forward because, of course, they need to be able to access that technology in, in regulated exams. And don't get me on what literacy means to some people. That's another argument. But and then take that same skill set into the workplace. I think we can make uh, great things happen. Um, we have an assistive technologies pilot program. We have designed it. Microlink are ready to roll it out. And we are excited that schools are already embracing the possibilities because that technology doesn't just serve young people with hidden uh, send needs. Think about um, children affected by migration coming to this country without uh, with skills, with knowledge, with intelligence, but not being able to access the curriculum. The same technology can translate things in real time for those individuals. Delayed language development, that doesn't have to be a barrier. We can use the same technology to support those young people. And of course, um, you know, today I've got an app on my phone. It's called Lookout Free. You can just put it on a piece of paper and it will read it to you. There is so much going on here. And uh, yes, we need specialist software. Of course we do. But if we start to spread those uh, services that are, if you like, um, inclusive by design that are out there, we can make great things happen. Thank you very much for listening at the end of an incredibly informative few three hours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. You, you followed very, very well. I wouldn't uh, you know, worry about where your position is in a, a panel in the future, okay? <laughs> Just to use a positive feedback. I think what you're describing here is what Matt alluded to before, and that is universality. You know, in other words, if you use technologies to make sure that everybody's yeah. included, and I, you know, Chrissy, you mentioned earlier on about uh, making sure that everybody was using the technology, people weren't just singled out because they had a need, it, and it added value everywhere. And Andy, your fantastic um, presentation there about how you develop confidence in people when knowing what they can attain. All of these things are really good in positive, sending out positive messages. And you Absolutely. had the, um, I, I think, uh, Matt Hancock, when he left, was giving you the signal that he'll be taking forward a lot of these sort of themes to the minister who's now been handed over this bill. And it's important that bills get the practical side of this right as well as the ethos and the policy makers and totally. the commissioning side. You've and got to get it I've, present for the people who are going to use it. And, and Mike, you know, we, I, you know look, look at the power in this around this table. I, you know, yes, it'll be great to get policy on side with us. But I think we all carry on uh, regardless and, and, and do our best to, to, to meet these needs and make change from, from the perspectives that we're in. We have to be relentlessly positive about what we can do and, and, and keep making that progress in spite of, despite of policy. And maybe policy will have to follow uh, the good example made by the people around the table today. Um, I'm going to bring in, if you, if you, if you wouldn't mind, Jane Thurgood so Parks um, about uh, Ofsted and their role here and, and what, what they're, they're looking at, or looking for, perhaps. Hello, um, I'm an inclusion consultant. I work for Sefton Local Authority. And what we've seen within Sefton in recent Ofsted is that there's been a massive focus put on reading, which I think most people knew there's been a huge focus put on reading. But particularly looking at joining up reading to language and understanding of language. Um, I'm very, very much using sort of multi-sensory approaches that those of us who've worked sort of with students with dyslexia and dyscalculia, we have advocated for a long, long time. And there just seem to be this recognition from Ofsted that this is, is a very good way to go. And they are very, very much advocating those processes in education. Jane, that's absolutely right. And and uh, uh, I think Ofsted have moved quite quickly uh, over since, uh, I think it was September, 2018. 
when a school can dem if a school can demonstrate intent implementation and impact around the needs of a young person who might not be if you like conventionally academically uh, on a pathway if a school can demonstrate that they will not be held back in fact they'll be praised for being inclusive so there are changes happening but you're absolutely right jane more schools need to embrace that Thanks, everybody. I'm um, looking for further comments. Uh, I'm going to go back to Ruth Bromley, and uh, she's been posting quite a bit on this. And uh, you're obviously enthused by what you've heard in the last 20 minutes, as I heard. That a key to come in. Yeah. Um, thanks. Like everything I am privileged to do in my working life, I usually learn more than I impart when I agree to do something like this. So I had imposter syndrome and nearly didn't agree to <laughs> come today, but it's just been incredible. And it just makes me feel hopeful um, for the future. I think if we can join some of these conversations up, I'd be really interested to know what we could do in primary care to support some of the work that's going on in primary education, whether that's understanding, promoting or signposting families that feel like they're in crisis a little bit more effectively. I think that could actually be a really useful piece of work because we often are the first port of call, but we're often also not the best person to help, although we really want to. The other thing is therefore we, we avoid the burden of additional harm to families and parents. And I think it was Fiona who spoke near the beginning today talking about the impact on her mental well-being. So, you know, we're, we're all supporting each other, but more importantly, we're supporting a whole family unit then to be able to cope much better and perhaps feel positive and inspired. And what more could we hope for from our sort of public sector services and the benefit of tax really? We live in complex societies where simple solutions are rarely the ones that work, but sometimes very simple solutions, actually just asking people what they want, coming back to, to Chris's point earlier on, actually works very, very well. Um, I, I'm just going to ask Bruna Tom, is it, who uh, is going to give a contribution around uh, the language side of this? And of course, we do live in a complex society where multicultural, multilingual, and, and different areas of the country have different. Uh, challenges in terms of the number of languages which are spoken in their schools and in their general practice roof. <laughs> it's often a difficulty as, as, as I remember. Um, so Bruno, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Sorry, did you call me? I did, yes. I just wanted oh, to you want sorry to about it. elaborate uh, a little bit. Just, just a moment, please. Uh, I, I was just listening. Um, uh, yeah, so I, as I said, I am a researcher here in Japan, and most of the like the problems I can see like in Europe, it's only focus on European languages, right? So logographic language like Chinese, uh, Japanese, Egyptian uh, has a little different techniques. One example, um, the the I don't remember his name, Andy, like said, like about the biscuit and like the word. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this doesn't work, uh, not in the specific way like you express, because most of the problems like with, uh, I, I have a discussion with like Belgian uh, researchers and Finland, the problem is like the shape, the shape of the word. And it's not about like the, the, the connection with like the, the entity, but with like the sound versus the shape of the word. So like, this is like the, the major problem. For example, uh, in Japanese, uh, most of the dyslexic students uh, also have like dyslexia in kanji. So kanji, it's like a logographic. So think about like a person you de design like this way, right? Oops. they also have like a problem so it's uh 3.51 percent if i remember very well of like the students also have dyslexia in hiragana in katakana they also have in kanji mm -hmm. so it's not a problem about picture versus word it's about the shape so like most of like the researchers focus on like the shape of the the word, then just like connect a word with the entity. So that's, it's maybe like, I, I feel when I hear like all you guys like talking, I, I, I can hear like 
people like only focus like English, English or some European language and have much more around the world. And dyslexia, it's, it's, it's vast. Like dyscalculia, I think like what's the other lady I forgot here. I'm sorry. Um, uh, dyscalculia was where I started because I'm a like physics teacher. So I can notice when like the student doesn't understand the number one and cannot like calculate with the number one. And this is have like a really good research about like English speakers, Russian speakers and Japanese speakers uh, through like the dyscalculia. And dyscalculia, it's very impressive like part because Japanese researchers said like doesn't have like too much like dyslexia, but on my daily basis, as a teacher here, I can see like that. And like Japanese researchers, uh, this study, English, Russian, and Japanese said the numbers in Japanese are so complex, they prefer like to talk by the numbers than by the language. And this is like, it's some kind of like, shape of the culture uh, also. So it's different aspects of the dyslexia too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a very international flavor to, to finish with our, our, uh, our webinar today. Um, I, I just want to uh, sum up a little bit here now and uh, perhaps think about the commission and what, what it's, it's going to be used for. And Ben, please feel free to interrupt if you want to add to that. But I think we've had some pretty impressive comments today and impressive presentations. And, and the thing that for, from a novice in this field, other than that as a, as a father of, of, of a child with borderline uh, problems in, in your diagnosis of this, it's, it's one of those things where the, the world has moved on. People have recognized, as Andy has so forthrightly said today, that actually you can achieve a lot once you get that diagnosis and once you're, you're given the technologies. Uh, we've got uh, the politicians now looking at this in detail and about how we will commission those services in the future. But I think, Ruth, you made the point earlier on uh, uh, around uh, the difficulty of working in challenged communities to get the uptake up to a level that everybody needs to get. And Chrissy, you, you mentioned that as well when you were talking about your businesses. I, I do like this idea, Maris, around the um, the fact of the, the achievements that people have and reporting them and using new tools that actually make a difference in, in, in their lives very, very rapidly. Um, and and Bruno, you, you mentioned um, the complexities of language and the fact that we concentrate on, on the, the English language far too much perhaps, but it's the one we have to use here most of the time, so I guess we're going to carry on doing that for a while yet. Um, and then going back to the beginning when, when Matt was here, that commitment to change and the commitment that uh, Claire Thomas, the head of therapy level schools, gave at the beginning and the oversight that she, the overview she gave at that time. And then moving on to some of the practical examples and the, the, this lovely idea about the narrative and reading and reading in groups and making sure that you're including people and getting them to read. And Andy, when you did your um, biscuit with the cup in it, I think that's one of the most inclusive things I've ever seen in terms of the disability that we're demonstrating for people. Um, thank you all for your comments. Um, we'll uh, send you out the links to, to the various videos and papers that have been in the chat. Um, I'm sure this commission is going to push forward the agenda and hopefully when there's revision of the bill plus the green paper, that Ben and I'm sure with his past parliamentary experience will be lobbying to make sure, sorry, I won't use the word lobbying and Ben, that's the wrong word these days, we'll be advocating <laughs> the inclusion of many of the points you've made today. Um, and thank you for those who've offered to help me uh, on, to, in the chat in getting the patient's perspective of new technologies in this particular area for, for, for the research I do myself. And so I'm going to close it there, Ben, and many thanks everyone for your commitment and contribution today.